you want to maybe just quickly introduce yourself and just sure. let everybody know who you are, I'll spotlight you. Excellent. Oh, um, well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Val Waite and I'm the shop manager and volunteer coordinator for Adam EcoSavvy. As you can obviously tell by the name, we are located over on the Isle of Arran um, and we're just here today to do a presentation for you. Um, I'll go into a wee bit just about kind of how the charity started and, and all the different things that we do because we've got many different sides to the project. But today we're going to focus more in on e-bikes and sustainable travel and transport. So I've also got with us today, we've got Andrew Binney, who's the Sustainable Travel and Transport Coordinator um, for EcoSavvy. So he's going to be able to give a wee bit more in-depth knowledge. <laughs> yeah, give us a wave. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> um, the, the other half of his team is, is currently at home with our little baby, so she's not, not quite back at work yet. So I'm really pleased Andrew could, could come along to, to help out today as well. So, um, And it's just really nice to be at Green Hive again, because I've joined you for one of your volunteer meetings and it was just so lovely and, and you're a fantastic organisation as well. And I think we've got a lot of things in common that we're, we're trying to do. So if we can share knowledge and, and just help each other out, then I think it's a, a really worthwhile thing to do, so. Oh, thank oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just sort of set the scene for people just as people are starting to tick in now. Um, so just to let everybody know, um, your mics are muted just now, uh, just to stop the screen jumping back and forth uh, between people. Um, and I will... Oh. There we go, that's better. <laughs> I'm so um, sorry, I muted you by accident. I was trying to mute me. myself. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then the screen jumped. I'm so sorry, Carol. That's okay, that's me, that's me. So yeah, to stop things like that from happening, um, I've got you all muted for just now. Um, if you do have questions that pop up during the talk or during the presentation, um, you should all have access to the chat function and you'll be able to pop in your messages there. So I'm just going to send everybody a little chat just now. Um, another thing that we'll use the chat for is dropping in any links that, um, that we might have from Val, from Andrew, from myself, so that you can just quickly access them and um, you'll get access to all the links and everything like that in a follow-up email as well at the end of the presentation. Um, so, yep, your mics will be muted throughout. Uh, feel free to have your videos on or off. Uh, this is being streamed onto YouTube, so you will be able to watch it later on as well if you if you do miss any part of it. Um, so feel free to tune in there. Um, and, yep, I've got a, a couple of polls. Um, so we've got one for the start of the talk and then one at the end of the talk. And um, I just want to gauge your understanding on e-bikes and on Aaron EcoSavvy and sort of find out from you what you feel the most sort of, what, what barriers there are to switching to bikes and what support you might need um, in order to be able to, um, you know, support an e-bike as a, a main mode of transport. So um, I'll pop up those polls just now, just so that we can get the, the data capture stuff out of the way and get onto the exciting stuff. So, um, you don't have to answer this, by the way, it's, it's entirely up to yourselves, but any data that I've got it makes my life a million times easier for planning out projects. So there we go. So hopefully you should all see that wee poll on your screen now. So if you want to take just a couple of minutes just to fill out that wee poll, that'd be amazing. And then we'll, um, I'll jump in and I'll let um, Val and Andrew tell us all about Aaron EcoSavvy and their e-bikes.
Okay, I'm just going to call it here. Thank you very much for everybody that popped in answers. That is amazingly helpful. There we go. And uh, if you didn't get time or if you'd like to um, have a little look at the poll in more detail, I've got a bigger survey that I'll share with you uh, towards the end of the webinar. So, yep, just a quick recap. Um, so please use the chat function um, as much as you can. If you have any questions that occur um, throughout the talk, we've got a special questions and answer session dedicated at the end of the webinar. Um, or Val and Andrew might just jump in and answer it for you whilst it comes up as well. Um, and uh, yep, we've already got a chat there. Yep, shower function was definitely one of the options. Um, if if people want to shower after having a cycle, that that if that if that's what might help them, then uh, yep, we want to include that too, possibly, in the future. Okay, so without further ado, um, I should have probably introduce myself. My name is Caroline. I work at Greenhive, and we are here today, um, along with Aaron Ikosavi, to talk about sustainable travel specifically e-bikes and how they can actually revolutionize um, travel within small towns and, and uh, you know, local areas uh, for businesses and for um, members of the community. And um, Aaron Ikosavi have got a really successful um, e-bike project set up and running um, for a wee while now. So we wanted to sort of ask them their sort of insights and get some information to see if that's something that we could maybe look at doing here in Nern. Um, so it's not specific to NERN. Um, if you don't stay in NERN, it's okay. I'm sure there'll be stuff that you'll pick up from this that you'll be able to, to use as well. Um, and I'm going to pass over now to Val Wait from Aaron Ecosavvy. Hi, thank you, Caroline. Um, just for those who weren't there just right in the beginning, um, I was just saying I'm the shop manager and volunteer coordinator for Ecosavvy. And we've also got with us today Andrew Binney, who is Ecosavvy's sustainable travel and transport officer, one of them. Um, and he he very much deals, knows a lot about e-bikes. So um, it's great we can pass things on to you. So I've prepared a wee presentation, which I'm just gonna share with you. Hopefully I'll be able to do it. Um, what do we see? I did this perfectly in the practice, but <laughs> just bear with me a wee second. So, um, oh, just move this out the way. There we go. Um, so I was just going to start off by giving you all just a wee feel for EcoSavvy, like how we started and where we're, we're at now. So the pictures here we've got are of the shop um, that, oh no, this isn't working. Oh no, it is working. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, so basically adding EcoSavvy um, started as an not for, for profit in March 2013 and we opened a little community shop completely run by volunteers in 2014 and it really just kind of started out mostly as upcycled goods a lot of crafty people in the community were you know recycling and, and making new things that we were selling and then over time we started then taking donations so we're much more of a you know like a normal kind of typical charity shop now um, but we also sell a lot of eco products as well just offering people alternative to plastics like bamboo toothbrushes and shampoo that's you know just in a bar and not in a plastic bottle and um, I, I think obviously you know we, we can all do recycling but I think if we just don't use things in the first place then, then that's really good so we're just using the shop to to give people different options and, and educate them a bit more about about what all we can do because I think all of the little things we do can add up to a whole lot in terms of helping with the effects of climate change um, so we're managed by a board of trustees and we've got a fantastic volunteer open working group and we now, just over lockdown, I didn't even think we would get any new volunteers, but I'm so pleased that we did. Um, so we now have over a hundred and we have seven members of staff. So as you can see, our aims are to identify and accomplish environmental projects and increase environmental sustainability and support people in, in making choices about more sustainable living. So, um, Within EcoSavvy, we're really kind of split into four different areas. So um, we, we got funding for a sustainable island life project from the Climate Challenge Fund. 
So we split it into four. So we've got food that we look at. We're doing cookery lessons, teaching people more about gardening. And we've got a brilliant food share scheme as well, where the co-op at the end of every day, they hand over all the fresh products that would just, I mean, previously all just went in the bin. It's absolute madness when you think about it. Um, so then we started up the food share scheme. So every village gets a turn at having it and the food's just given away for nothing rather than it going in the bin. And I think so far that's been about 45,000 pounds worth of food that has been saved from the bin, which is just absolutely staggering. Um, we also, on the waste side of things, I've already said uh, about the shop, but I'm also at the moment trying to organize different workshops for upcycling, you know, make a new lampshade for yourself, use no bits of material, things like that. So we're really trying to, to, to kind of up what we're doing on that side of things. And we've also got someone who looks at energy, who goes out and edits, eh, sorry, not edits, audits people's houses and does EPC certificates. Uh, that's Charlotte. She she came round to my house actually and just made different suggestions. Um, it only up cost about fifty pounds in total, like putting a chimney balloon and just how to insulate your home really easily. And it really has made such a big difference already. And also, you know, giving people advice about solar and and other things as well. And the travel side of things is obviously what we're going to be talking more about today. Unfortunately, our lift share programme, which we were just really starting to get off the ground, has had to be stopped for the moment due to COVID. But we're hoping as soon as we can, we'll obviously get it back up and running. There's also the green map and the e-bikes, which we'll be talking about today. So, I mean, in total, between everything that we've been doing, that's 500 tonnes of CO2 was saved by the Adam community over a couple of years. And when the shop, I started, we started weighing things and counting up how much we were saving from landfill. So just from January and February this year, it was 1.1 tonnes, which again is just amazing. All of this just would have gone into landfill in the past. So we have a lovely picture here of Andrew and Emma, who's currently still on maternity leave and they are our sustainable travel and transport coordinators. And you'll be hearing more from Andrew a wee bit later on. So the Sustainable Island Life Project started in 2019. And really the, the main aim is to promote and implement a reduction in car usage amongst the residents. So we've got the, the schemes I've talked about. And we, we bought our first e-bikes in April 2009. And we are now up to 12 bikes. So I think for you guys, you know, it's, it's, it's great to see what, what can be achieved over a relatively short space of time. It's obviously been fantastic, you know, having funding from the Climate Challenge Fund and that's really helped us, us move forward. So our e-bike flight fleet, so we've got nine hybrid e-bikes, one cargo trailer, one Jorvik trike, one giant mountain bike, and Andrew is looking in, into buying four cube compacts for key workers. And I think I'm going to pass over to him because he is more of the expert on this. So maybe, Andrew, if you could just talk people through why you like certain bikes, what, what are the benefits and features of the different ones that we have at EcoSavvy? Yeah, okay. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Andrew Binney. I'm one of the uh, EcoSavvy Savvy Traveller uh, co coordinators. Uh, so I've been uh, working with the program since uh, May last year. I think it was May, April, May, something like that. Yeah. And um, what we do with the bikes is, um, as uh, Val was saying, we've, we've got um, 11, 11 bikes total, uh, nine are hybrid bikes. And um, typically they're out with local uh, businesses or organizations or charities. And uh, up until COVID, we were, we were perhaps giving people uh, or groups maybe six bikes at a time. Uh, for their employees and the idea there was that they would use the bikes uh, instead of their cars to commute on Aaron. Um, on Aaron, the kind of key, one of the key limitations of uh, cycling on Aaron is actually the, is, is the hills. Um, they're fine if you're into cycling, you're, you know, you're a kind of, uh, a kind of lycra, lycra cyclist, 
uh, those guys like the hills. Uh, but for your average commuter, they, they don't really want to be slogging up a really steep hill and then arriving at work feeling tired and potentially a bit sweaty. Uh, so the e-bikes were kind of seen as a, as a solution to that. Um, so the, the bikes we've got, I mean, they, they fall into um, uh, different types of bikes. Um, first of all, so you've got like hy hybrid bikes, which are kind of good for the city and out of, out of town, and you can even take them on uh, forestry tracks. Uh, we have a mountain bike, which is really specifically for uh, kind of mountain bike riding, and we, we, we kind of share that bike with the local school mountain, mountain bike club. Uh, and there the bike's quite good for either teachers who are finding it hard to keep up with their kids uh, when they're doing mountain biking up the local hills, uh, or sometimes for like um, kids who don't quite have the same strength as the, as the other kids. So it, um, one of the good things about e-bikes e is that it kind of democratizes or sort of levels out access to um, e-bikes. So it means that, um, you know, yeah, if you're, as I was just saying, if you're younger, uh, you don't have the strength or maybe you're, you're older uh, and you used to be a cyclist or, or you always wanted to do a bit of cycling but the hills are too daunting um, that it just allows you to kind of you know access cycling in a way where you probably maybe weren't so enthusiastic before. Uh, we also have uh, an e-trike uh, which is a, a Jorvik e-trike and I would say that uh, E-trikes sound great, everybody likes the idea of them, but actually they're kind of quite counterintuitive. Like people are used to going on a bike and actually they they work out their own balance naturally. Uh, whereas on a trike, you're very much um, sort of conditioned by the camber of the road. So if there's even a slight slope, you feel like you're kind of like leaning off to one side on them. So I would say that the, our Jorvik trike has not been a great success. I would not recommend uh, going for trikes unless you're have tried one and you really, really like it for one reason or another. Uh, sometimes people think they're a kind of solution to kind of mobility problems, like, you know, people who um, maybe having to use, um, you know, mobility aids and things like that. Uh, it, they might be, but uh, our experience has been that they're, they're not really, really, if you're, if you have a mobility issue, you're better off, um, you know, looking at that as a very kind of specific, specific thing and looking at other other options, uh, unfortunately, um, the uh, we we haven't gone for. I mean, you can you can get like any kind of electric, any kind of bike you can get as an electric bike. You can get like a e bike, uh, you know, racing bike, road bike, uh, mountain bike as we've got, or just a standard uh, commuting bike. The bikes we find that are the most uh, attractive to the kind of general population are, are hybrid or cross bikes. You know, that are, will generally handle commuting and uh, a little bit of forestry riding, that, that type of thing. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, mainly two different models we've been using. We've, we've, be, we've initially had uh, Giant e-bikes. Um, Giant are one of like, the biggest uh, bicycle manufacturers in the world. Um, and we have, uh, I think we have uh, five of those. And then we also have uh, rally, rally bikes. Um, the Giants are, a bit more expensive, and actually, we have not been—we've not been so quite so happy with those as with the, with the, with the rallies. They're a bit more expensive, a bit more. The, the giants are a bit more expensive, a bit heavier, and I've also had some issues with them um, in terms of the electronics. One, one of the, one of the things to th remember about e-bikes is they are more complicated than normal bikes. So you have to think about the electrics and the displays and the fact you've got you know batteries and motors and things so there are, there are actually more things in e-bikes to go to go wrong um and that has um implications for like time spent on maintenance and things like that so we found that with the giants we had um they may well have fixed this problem now but the bikes we had uh suffered from water ingress into the displays and uh i had to replace all the all the um the displays on the on the giants which is quite a big job um, the rallies are kind of simpler. They don't have the ones we're using or their um, uh, Motus uh, Grand Tours, the one, ones we've bought. And uh, they have Bosch motors, uh, Bosch batteries, and um, they're just uh, straightforward nine-speed nine uh, gears. So they don't have like a double chain ring at the front, for instance, as some of the giants do. So for average kind of cycling, you, you kind of want to keep it as simple as possible. 
when we've been hiring out uh, bikes, if there's too many gears in the bikes, it kind of confuses people if they're not used to them. Um, and um, also makes the maintenance more, more complicated. Uh, a couple of the, the giants we've got actually have drive belts rather than chains and they have uh, hub uh, gears like uh, we've got so daily tour uh, bikes. Um, I think, I'm not, don't know if you can see the guy uh, in the red with a white bike, that's a daily, daily tour bike. Um, and that has a kind of drive bell, so you don't have a chain, and uh, you, you you know you don't have um, complicated derailleur mechanisms at the back that get mucked up and things like that. So yeah, so you've got a choice of uh, diff different types of bikes and also different models. Um, they're quite uh, th th because of COVID and the fact we had like good weather earlier in the year, and also the fact that e-bikes are kind of taking off as a kind of revolution in e-bikes. There's big demand for e-bikes at the moment. So you part, if you're buying an e-bike, you're kind of partly constrained by what's actually available in, in local shops. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, for instance, we would, we would have liked to have bought some more uh, rallies, but we actually can't, can't uh, order them at the moment. Uh, probably not until the new year. So we're looking at other bikes like the COVID, the, um, the Cube bikes that we talked about. So maybe I'll shut up now. That's been quite a bit of a chat. No, that, that's that been fantastic, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just sort of put on to, to a picture of the mountain bike um, and the e-trike, as, as Andrew said as well. Um, I think the, yeah, the thing with the e-trike is you think as well, there's lots of storage space as well, but there's a wee bit further on in the presentation about storage possibilities, because obviously you want to use your e-bikes to go to work and you need everything you know with you in your bag and work stuff or or if you want to go and do your shopping so it's definitely something you know we need to think about so Andrew obviously you know kind of touched on how how the e-bike challenge started and and it was really just offered out to different workplaces so they'd have them for a certain amount of time usually a month I think actually and everybody would keep a note of how many miles they've done you know and, and how they actually found it we have found since that quite a few people have gone on to actually buy their own e-bike because they then realised how great it was. And I think as well, it also helps help some people build up their fitness enough that then they could actually go, you know, they could tackle the hills on their normal bike. So just even to kind of get their level of fitness up, that was a really big big plus but there have been quite a lot of people that are you know just realizing why do I need to take the car to my work every day which has been absolutely fantastic so I think that's a picture we've got some nurses and some people from Adam Dairies on the island that they got it and um, first of all and we've got some of the the high school teachers traveling home from work as well so every company received an act travel action plan and an information pack as well so really good to, to just give people a bit more education about it and also to get feedback about how they they found the experience so we've just got some some statements from different people people we've got Jude who is the CCF project manager and Sheila Gilmore is just saying it's a fantastic opportunity for our businesses to try out e-bikes and help their staff reduce their carbon footprint and get fitter into the bargain it's a win-win for everyone and yeah we cannot echo that enough it's absolutely fantastic um and these are some of just i mean there's been loads of responses from people but i just just picked out a few i know andrew mentioned the lycra brigades previously and and i think it's taken that kind of association away from biking you know and and, and just making people think, look, I don't need to get into the Lycra, I can just get on it, I, I won't sweat as much as the nor on a normal bike, and, you know, it's, it's just brilliant. Um, I know the second statement, somebody saying that they were at the distillery, I don't know if any of you have visited the Lochranza distillery in Arden, but there is one hell of a hill there, I have to say, it's very, very long, um, and, and I think the, the last one just made me smile so much, you know, 50 year old asthmatic out for an hour and a half around a forestry route and I think just that grinning from ear to ear that's what it's about as well it's, it's you want people to enjoy being on the e-bikes as well and I, I mean I know personally being on a normal bike over here I um 
yeah, it's, I'm not smiling, you know, I'm grimacing as I'm trying to go uphill. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, this is an, ama an amazing figure as well. So that's 10,652 miles of car travel replaced by e-bike miles which again is just brilliant and the amount of CO2 that's uh, not been put into the atmosphere through this and if you know if we can get more and more people into this then just think of all the savings that, that we could make um, just absolutely brilliant so again Andrew touched upon the pros you can actually fly up those hills People who are not on e-bikes kind of give you that funny look, thinking, how are you managing this so quickly? Um, but we don't need to tell them the secret, you see, that we're actually on e-bikes. You can arrive without a sweat, and it means you can replace car journeys, you know, to your work and things. And as Andrew said, it's great for all ages and, and different abilities as well. So the cons are, they are quite expensive. It can be £2,000 for, for a new bike. That's why I think schemes like, like we're doing and obviously Green Hiver and embarking on as well is that it can give people the, the opportunity to actually try them first of all, see what they like about them. And I know our chairperson, Helen, she had a trial of one. So when she actually went to buy one, she knew what she wanted. She knew what she did like and didn't like about the one she got and discussed it more, I think, with Andrew. And, and then she could make a much more informed decision because it is quite a lot of money to, to pay out. So you want to arm yourself with all, all the knowledge all the knowledge that you can. Um, they are heavy compared to push bikes. And as, again, as Andrew said, more can go wrong, um, which, you know, you might not be so comfortable fixing yourself as well. So that's another thing to think about. And they're water resistant rather than waterproof. So maybe, Andrew, you could just talk through the different carrying options for us. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we, we have kind of thought about getting, you know, potentially getting cargo bikes. Um, we spoke to um, a group in Glasgow called Bikes for Good, and um, they kind of uh, one of the things about these you know, like kind of purpose-built cargo bikes is they're, they're actually very expensive. And um, if people are not used used to using them, then you know they're not necessarily that confident in in taking one. Um, but that might be quite different if you were like buying a bike specifically for a business purpose. Uh, or you know, charitable purpose where you were using it every day. Maybe you had you know one or two riders who were used to used to using it. We haven't bought a cargo bike as such. Uh, we have uh, bought uh, a trailer which just attaches onto the the rear rear axle of any of the bikes we've got. And um, a couple of the locals, like a couple of local nurseries, um, one guy called uh, Robin Leave, Robin's Leaves, another one uh, Woodside Farm. And they both uh, tried the uh, the trailer out. Um, they might have actually benefited from having a purpose-built um, cargo bike, you know, if they felt that was going to be right, going to be right for them, because it would have been a bit more heavy duty. Um, some of the the uh, trailers are, you know, they're quite lightweight, you know, so they're good for kind of carrying kind of lighter goods. But if you're loading them up with potatoes or something like that, then they're not going to, um, you know, handle it that well. Um, there's, um, sometimes we, we find like people think, you know, that um, you, know, you can get a bike and then just kind of put all your gear in, in, a, in a rucksack or something on your back. That's really a bad idea, you know, whether it's an electric bike or, or a normal bike, as I'm sure people uh, discovered various times. Um, you know, it's just too, it's too much weight on your upper body. It's kind of bad, bad for the balance and it's really bad for your back because it, it kind of counters, kind of goes against your kind of cycling motion to a certain extent. It's okay. If you just have like a wee knapsack or something, if you're kind of running around town, that's fine, I find. Um, but overall, I think um, just having uh, panniers on our bikes, I've got like a kind of a kind of straightforward uh, pannier. It's just a kind of uh, very um, simple, simple design. Um, and uh, they just stick on the on the um, on the back on a, on a rack. But and you know they're great for like you know small items and and uh, like a little bit of shopping that type of thing, but you can actually buy you know panniers of any size. You can have panniers on the front and the backs, and you can actually carry a huge amount of um, 
uh, you know, goods on a bike. If you think about people who go cycle touring, you know, they're carrying, you know, tents and all their food and, you know, changes of clothes and tools and all sorts of things. So um, if you've got a hybrid bike, they should be able to, they'll, they'll be able to handle um, panniers. And panniers are probably like uh, a good way of, um, they're not too, they're not too expensive. Um, you're not, you're not having to tow an extra trailer. And it also means you're, you're not kind of ending up with like a very specialized, specialized bike. So we have found like, you know, for sort of general use, like panniers are actually a pretty, a pretty good, op pretty good option. Um, and also because they can kind of sit on the, on the, on the rack and they're fairly low, then, you know, they don't cause kind of, you know, um, putting, they don't put you off balance too much. You get used to them quite quickly. So that's our thoughts on panniers and uh, ways of carrying goods. Thank you very much, Andrew. So we are going to move on actually to your top 10 tips for everyday riders. So sorry, it's back to you again, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> We're going to get sick of listening to me. <laughs> no. um, okay. Um, yeah, probably some of these, these uh, points I've kind of covered before. Um, it's really just kind of, uh, I, I can send you a link to this uh, later. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're thinking about getting a bike, you know, the first thing to do is like, you know, try, try one out, go to the shop, try one out there. Even better if you've got a friend who's got one, try, try that. Um, most e-bikes will, will feel fantastic because you get on them and it feels like, you know, somebody's pushing you from behind. So, um, you know, you need to be a little bit careful about that when you go to a shop, try out a, a few different ones, make sure you get one that, that, that really uh, fits you. And, uh, and don't be lured into, um, obviously these are all kind of personal choice things, but in general, I would say don't be lured into getting a bike that doesn't have mud guards or, or a rack because you, you will want both of those. It's not, even an electric bike is not much fun if you're getting sprayed with uh, road water all the time. Um, if you're just doing general cycling commute is, uh, a, a, a hybrid is probably the best option. Um, it's also quite important where you buy your buy your bike from. You know, most people will try to sell you a, an electric bike, but if you've got a choice of bike shops, have a have a look around them and uh, see who seems to be talking the most sense and giving you the most options and has got the best prices. Um, their models are always changing. Um, they probably don't have a huge amount of stock in in shop, um, so have a look around and see see who's giving you the best best deals. Uh, you. You need to think about things like if the bike breaks down, how easy is it to get the bike back to the the bike shop? So, for instance, if you have a bike shop in there, and that's great. If you've got one in Inverness, that's probably pretty good as well, or in Elgin. Um, you know, places you can kind of get to with by train is quite handy, so you don't have to try and put a bike in a car. Um, you you probably are going to have the odd, odd issue that needs to be sorted out. Um, as we were saying earlier, I think, you know, most bikes, they, they are quite expensive, you know, so you're probably to get, to get a half decent bike, you're probably going to be spending over £2,000. Um, you can get uh, um, loans from the Energy Saving Trust. They'll, they'll loan you up to, I think it's up to £3,000 and they'll give you four years to pay it back. So that, that's actually quite a good deal. Uh, on Aran, we have quite a lot of hills and you probably have quite a few hills up there around. Uh, the place if you're going a bit further so the, you need to think about the, the the battery size and motor power that type of thing uh, so typically if you're going for uh, a battery that's sort of maybe four, 400 watt hours or 500 watt hours um, we've been very happy with Bosch motors um, so if you're getting a, a motor that's maybe an active line plus that type of thing it's a kind of thing to ask the, the bike shop you know what what uh, how much torque does it have and what kind of range would the bike have the the range is ultimately comes down to you you know if you don't use the battery if you don't use the motor and you're not using the the power so much then you're going to go further uh but if you're including a few hills in any any kind of uh, trip then your you know your battery's going to um you know run out slowly so you know typically an, an e-bike will you'll probably cover maybe I don't know, 60 miles to 80 miles a day, that type of thing. So uh, you need to think about that. You can recharge during the day. So if you get to a cafe or something, you could you could potentially take your charger with you and recharge. 
so yeah, a really important thing is, as I've touched on before, is uh, servicing and keeping an eye on what's happening with your bike. Bikes are, e-bikes like normal bikes have a lot of moving parts and a lot of those parts are exposed to the elements. So you should really be sort of actively maintaining your bike, uh, not, not sort of cycling over hundreds of miles and then uh, you know, wondering why it doesn't work properly anymore. So like every hundred miles you should be really, after every trip really, you should give it a quick check over, make sure the tires are inflated, um, nothing's coming loose, that type of thing. You can save yourself a lot of time and money by just making sure everything's tight and uh, uh, you know, getting to the point where things are rattling loose and then you're losing bits on the road or the screws are getting um, shredded, that type of thing. Um, so that's really important. So if you, you know, if, if you, you know, if you, there's loads of, there's loads of videos on, on YouTube that show you how to fix things and, uh, uh, or if you know somebody who's happy to have a look at your bike every now and again, that's, that's really helpful. Um, what else? Uh, if you're buying a bike, uh, don't forget about things like uh, helmets and high vis uh, jacket, potentially lights as well. Most e-bikes do come with lights front, front and back. Uh, but it's quite good to have extra ones as well because the lights on the bikes can light the lights on e-bikes are a bit of a weak spot. I find they tend to get broken quite easily. Uh, so having your own lights is also quite good. Uh, and then just kind of being confident on the road, like uh, you know, be you know, be careful but but confident really, and especially if you're in traffic, no point in being the right, but also being squished by a by a big lorry or something. If I think there's any doubt on a crossing, I'll just kind of take it, take the bike off the side of the road and cross over like a pedestrian if it's a if it's a complicated crossing. I don't really like standing out in the middle of the road, for instance, and indicating right with trucks either side of me. Uh, so that's probably the main things. So if you have any questions, very happy to hear from you. <laughs> Not sure if we have questions at the moment, but we'll have another wee opportunity at the end. So if there's anything you think of, then, then please just keep a wee note of it and, and you can ask at the end. Um, Thanks for that, Andrew. I was going to say as well, in terms of confidence, that can be a problem. We had obviously hoped to do cycling proficiency type events and things to help pe improve people's confidence. But again, due to COVID, we've had to, you know, kind of, we've not really been able to achieve that at the moment, but it's still on the, the to, -do, to do list. So as Andrew said, there's lots of different videos on YouTube. We can always share these with you afterwards. Oh, sorry, I've just moved on quickly. Um, so, so you can have a wee look, but there, there's loads to, to have a look about on. Um, we also, over you know, the past couple of years, we held different events and um, teaching people how to fix their bikes. And we, we've also been doing things with the primary school, like um, the Energy Saving Trust came along with these bikes that were attached to blenders. So the kids got to cycle and make up their own smoothies which again was amazing just to, to try and get kids into cycling a bit more and create a wee bit of a buzz about it. Unfortunately, all these things are on hold. I'm so sorry about the graphics here. I had a bit of a computer malfunction, um, Never mind. We also did some film nights, which we've actually just, we're doing it online now. So if anyone's interested and in just go onto the Facebook page for Adam Nico Savvy, we have films. We were doing them every Tuesday night but they're, they're kind of changing nights at the moment just depending on what's happening. So we've got ones about foods, energy, waste and travel as well. So there's a couple of examples of ones that, that Andrew put together for us. Everything has changed for everybody. So Andrew has just been absolutely fantastic during lockdown. He jumped into action and the e-bikes were used for NHS staff, volunteers, taking shopping, medication to people. Um, we've also been working on a travel match, which I'll talk about really, really quickly in a wee minute, and helping with the food share. And also, Andrew has, has used one of the bikes so he can actually get about and do his work and avoid public transport as well, So, which has been absolutely brilliant. So the green travel map, it's really, I mean, there's lots of, I think you'll be the same as well. And if there's a kind of touristy area that you get lots of visitors to, a lot. Every, all the walks and everything focus on the beautiful rambling walks that you can do. 
but I think for local people, it's, it's about all the little shortcuts and things that only local people know about. So we wanted to map them. So obviously it's, it's in conjunction with the e-bike scheme so that, you know, when we're lending them out to businesses and and we also lend them out to individuals now as, as well who, who want to have a wee trial of it. Yeah, so we can just find wee easier bit ways of, of getting a about the place so we had a big event and people came along and, and looked at mapped out different routes and things and the, the travel map should come out quite soon but it's maybe something you guys could, could think about as well and we basically um added extra information into it as well so each route it was whether you've walked it whether you've cycled it and we've got volunteers to, to help with that but we also added in, could you take a pram up this way or could you get up in a wheelchair? And also little bits of information um, on my walks that I was doing for the travel map. I was saying, well, it's great for brambles at this time of year. And there's a fantastic patch of garlic here that you can pick as many leaves as you want. You know, it's just, it's abundant. So I think adding things like that into, it'll, it'll, you know, create a bit more interest as well. So. Um, it should hopefully come out soon, so I shall make sure and send you up some copies just to, just for your reference and to see if it's something you you would like to think about doing as well. And I just added this in at the end as well. It was actually amazing as a guy came over and cycled all fifty six miles round Aden on a penny farthing. I mean, I, I can't actually leave it. I think did you meet up with him, Andrew? Yeah, I took that photograph because. Um... I saw him going over the hill and I kind of chased him on my electric bike <laughs> and uh, he was going pretty quickly actually and um, yeah I had a quick chat with him and it turns out he'd cycled, he set the, the world record for cycling from uh, Land's End to John O'Groats uh, beating the previous record which was set about 100 years ago and uh, he actually cycled the length of the UK in under five days, quite amazing. Wow. Mm. That is absolutely fantastic so I th yeah, I think we, we, we should all be able to manage on an e-bike if this man can manage on a penny farthing. So. <laughs> um, and yeah, just to say thank you so much for listening. And as I said, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask us. And if you think of anything else after the event, then please just let Caroline know or we can I can leave my email address for you as well and, and you, can, you can contact me. So I should just come out of this and hopefully see all your lovely faces again and um, so please just hit us with any questions you have so one, one question i've got here val is um mm -hmm. we recently just sort of got our first e-bike and cargo trailer and we're really really excited about it and we're wondering how um our and eco savvy go about storing their e-bikes like did you build a facility or you know what kind of storage do you have? Because you've got a, a fleet, so I'm imagining your storage space would have started off small and then, and then got quite large. So yeah, yeah, could you tell us a little bit about safely storing and and how yeah. you keep them? I shall maybe divert to Andrew again for this one. Yeah, um, the thing with e-bikes is like you know they are an expensive item, so um, they're like old bikes, so they're quite nickable. Um, but e-bikes are just that bit more um, desirable. You know, and uh, so it's important to have like um, a good lock for them, and um, and to be able to lock them up over overnight somewhere. We ha we haven't had any issues on our end. You know, we haven't had any stolen or any any issues like that. But but um, but you could e easily could have you know, and it was easy enough for somebody to you know put a bike in the back of a van or something like that, and it could disappear quite quickly. Uh, so yeah, so having having somewhere to to lock the bike up at night is is uh, really important. Most of the time, our bikes are out with with um, their the you know people who are using them. So um, most of the time, I you know we don't have like the whole fleet in our shed. We've got we've we've recently bought uh, a little shed at the side of a sports pavilion in uh, Brodick, and um, I've kind of kitted that out with a. With a workbench and tools and things like that so if you can find a kind of community space is that that place is a bit of a you know it's a kind of community space that we've been able to we, we use the general building for like water and cups of tea and things like that and also we've got a sort of shed outside so so that's worked really well um we had to spend a wee bit of money on the shed 
but um, you know, it means we've got a base. And if we do have all the bikes in, like for instance, over Christmas, we'll probably get all the bikes in and store them over Christmas because it's quite difficult to guarantee that we can service them. You know, if something goes wrong with them over Christmas, then um, you know, we're not really in a position to help people out with them if we're not on the island or you know, that, that type of thing. Um, so it just means you're not getting awkward questions on Boxing Day or something. Somebody's even got a flat tire, that type of thing. Uh, so uh, yeah, so storage is quite is quite important, and also the bikes are they're quite heavy, so they, they have a kind of walk mode where you can kind of push the bike in it, and the motor kind of assists you to push it. Um, but having somewhere you can easily get the bike into, you know. So you know, for instance, if you live in a, in flats with like uh, you know multiple flights of stairs. You, you're probably going to want to keep the bike on the ground level somewhere. And then that's an added security issue. You have to think about, you're almost certainly not going to want to want to carry any bike up and down a whole, a whole lot of stairs. Definitely not. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, we did have another question and that was, um, so one of the things that um, we found is that, you know, like you were saying, e-bikes are, are really, really expensive and they can be quite, uh, difficult for people to buy personally for businesses to invest in especially right now and um, for charities to sort of get on board with so I was wondering if um, you could kind of go over again just a short little bit about um, how Aaron Eco Savvy was able to sort of come up with the concept and, and sort of gain the funding for it was it a specific funder that you went to that you targeted or did you find it yeah. was quite easy to get funding for for your e-bike initiative? Yeah there's, there seems to be quite a bit of funding around at the moment for buying for getting e-bikes um particularly like it was the climate challenge fund and the energy saving trust that funded us so we we bought um i think it was the first batch of five bikes from the energy saving trust grant and uh, the second batch has been through the climate challenge challenge fund who also fund the whole sustainable island life uh project you know so you know my job and and it was like four or five of us are all who are all uh, you know funded through that project. Uh, so and then there's because of COVID, we've been able to to go back to the Energy Saving Trust, and uh, we've requested like another ten grand, I think, uh, to buy these new Cube bikes, which also have Bosch motors. They're another uh, German brand, and uh, so that's yeah, that's how we got the money. So it's probably. You know, if you're if you're a charity, if you're listed charity, then getting the money is is not so hard. You know, it is always competitive, but you know, it's it's doable. But having a kind of good project, you know, and a good story to tell helps. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're you know we're planning to you know reduce you know car miles on the island is the basic story yeah. here, and, and really uh, probably probably twenty percent of people have gone on to buy their own e-bikes after they've they've used the bikes. Oh wow! Twenty wow! That's amazing. Yeah, it's quite high. Sometimes people have even bought the bikes before, before we've before they've you know had a shot on them. Oh wow! From from, from I, mean, I would say that you know, you know, it's it's really not a hard sell. You're not really having to convince people that e-bikes are a good idea. Um, you know, people have a have a, a go on one, even even if it's just for like an hour or half an hour, they'll definitely, almost certainly, quite like the idea of having one. The the, uh, the the kind of issues really are the cost of the bike. You know, it's like you know where do I get the money to buy one of these? You know, was for yeah. for average person, you know, like finding sort of two and a half thousand quid. You can get cheaper ones, but you know, for us, a, a sort of reasonably decent one, that's that's quite a lot of money. I completely agree, uh, definitely. And I've actually got um, a little piece here. Um, just if if we've got any other questions, then you know, please please pop them in. Thank you, Andrew. For, for the answer there um but um i've actually got a little piece here to sort of show you um what green hive have invested in um so val andrew if you guys are okay with me to sort of just uh running through a little presentation on um the e-bike that we decided to go for um here in nern and that will hopefully get people to maybe come and have a shot and come and have a try and see what you think you know try before you buy so I'm just going to quickly just pop this up on the screen and sort of introduce you to, sorry for the cat, introduce you to <laughs> my, uh, well, Green Hive's new e-bike and uh, cargo trailer. So let me just pop this up here for you. There we go. 
so here it is. Ta-da! Um, so this is our um, brand new Turn GSD-10 e-cargo bike. So I know Andrew was talking about um, the sort of differences between the bikes. Um, we actually opted to go for a cargo bike here in Nern. And one of the key reasons we uh, sort of went for that was because um, we wanted it to be available for um, people to use as sort of like business deliveries, but we also wanted it to be available for uh, people to sort of just take on a cycle around the town. And we, we don't really have any mountains or anything like that right on our doorstep, but we do have quite a lot of challenging cycling routes. So we kind of wanted a bike that would do the best of both worlds, uh, which is why we kind of settled on uh, um, e-cargo bike for for ourselves here in Nern. And this is the our very first bike, um, hopefully first of many, you never know. Um, and uh, what Andrew was saying about, you know, trying it for 15 minutes, half an hour, and then falling in love with it is absolutely true. Um, I desperately want a new bike for myself now after having a shot on this. So um, we opted for the brand Turn, um, another European brand. Um, on our e-bike, we've got a carry basket at the front um which is quite useful for keeping weight off your back like andrew was saying um we also have panniers um attached towards the rear of the bike as well um two panniers so one either side um we have a dual battery system and they're bosch batteries as well so very similar to the the ones that Aaron eco savvy are using um and uh yeah the motor speed what Andrew was saying about it feels like somebody pushing you from behind is completely true. It just takes off on you and, you know, cycling becomes an absolute joy when you're when you're using this bike. It's a little bit heavy to push around, you know, when you're pushing it around, getting it ready to cycle. But once you're on the bike, once you even without the motor on, it's not a heavy, bulky cycle. And when you turn the motor on, it just takes off. Um, you'll also notice that we decided to go ahead and purchase a trailer too. There were two trailers we could have went for. We could have went for an e-trailer, uh, an elect electronic trailer, or an, a just sort of normal trailer. We went for the normal trailer. Um, we chose a Carla trailer. Um, and the reason we wanted a trailer was because we do, normally we do a lot of large scale public events and we transport things like gazebos and tables and products and equipment around the town. And um, Nern does have a wee bit of a traffic problem so we think, well, we found that, you know, cycling and walking is actually a lot faster sometimes than driving. So the trailer should help us sort of um, transport that equipment quickly and easily because the weight is just lifted off with the, with the motor. We would also love to see businesses in the town use this setup. So use the trailer, the bike to actually carry out sort of intra-town uh, business deliveries, whether it's deliveries of food, maybe deliveries of items, invoiced items to each other, um, as well as members of the community taking the bike out around the town, cycling to places that they wouldn't normally be able to reach because of terrain or distance, and just enjoying um, cycling without that sort of fear of, oh, I better not go too far, or I better not tire myself out. Um, because this bike has two batteries, so you can do, I think it's 100 hours of straight cycling before, before it runs out, so you'll be fine. Unless you're cycling to Land's End. I wouldn't recommend that on one battery charge. So this is the, this is the setup that we kind of went for. Um, I've got a little bit of info here about the bike itself. So it's a Turn GSD S10 e-cargo bike. Um, we actually went with a company called Manchester Bike Hire um, and they've been amazing. They've helped us and guided us right the way through the process um, in choosing the right bike and the right setup for us. Um, we also had a lot of great advice from Seuss Trans and Inverness and Seuss Trans are like the national sort of um, cycling network. So I'll share a link to them as well, but they've been, they've been brilliant. And our e-cargo tra uh, cargo trailer, you can uh, download the specs for the trailer there too. Um, it's just brilliant. I love it. It's a nifty little thing and you hardly feel it when you're cycling along. And here is our manager, Neil, on um, our brand new e-bike setup. Uh, this is right before he took off on his inaugural tour of Nern. Um, so there you go there, looking very snazzy. Um, and even though it's a cargo bike and it's quite low down, it is foldable as well, which is cool. Um, the seat's fully adjustable. So, you know, anybody 
of any height, um, any age, can use this bike uh, fairly easily. And that's my wee tour for just now. I've actually got a video, which I'm going to link in the comments now, um, of our first ever virtual tour of Nern. And I would love it if you guys could have a little watch and let me know what you think and let me know, you know, what your, your thoughts are of using a bike to get around Nern um, and any sort of perceived uh, barriers that you, you think we might encounter. I'm just going to drop that link in the chat to you just now. Do -do 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 -do. And it features some amazing, amazing commentary from our uh, Green Hive manager, Neil, as well. So I'm sure you'll enjoy that. There we go. If you've never seen Nern, this is a perfect chance. You'll get to see all of it in one snazzy video. There you go. OK. And I'm seeing lots of messages coming in, so I'll check those out in a little second. Um, in fact, Val, Andrew, would you like me to maybe do the, will we round off with doing the Q&A just now? Yeah, that, that'd be good, yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's just have a little look here. Mm. On mute, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was gonna say there was a question that had come in from Neil um, about and saying, do the users of the bikes also take an interest or a role in maintenance or if we have a contract with someone who fixes them? So Andrew, would you be okay to answer that for us? Uh, yeah, so um, sometimes people do do minor repairs, like if it's a puncture, that type of thing, or um, you know, tires being pumped up, you know, that, th those kinds of things. Uh, but um, essentially, I'm the guy who repairs all the bikes and maintains all the bikes. So every month, you know, when they come back from uh, the people who've been using the bikes, then, uh, you know, I give them, a, you know, a complete uh, service, check everything's tight. Um, check the brakes are okay, the lights work, uh, nothing's broken, um, and then get them back on the road again. So um, all our bikes are getting to be about you know over a year old. So they, you do get increasing maintenance issues as they get older. Um, so it's it's pretty good to have a little workshop. But you could also have uh, like a local bike shop that you work with um, who hopefully gives you a kind of preferential deal on it it can end up taking quite a lot of you know hours you know working on bikes so you know you, you can rack up um you know quite a lot of expense if you're not careful so you just have to kind of make i mean we've got enough bikes that kind of justifies me doing the repairs uh but you know if you just have one bike maybe it makes more sense well it, it just depends if you're happy to do it yourself then you can do it, but generally it's not the users, you know, who are doing the maintenance because it gets, it can get quite kind of complicated if there's something wrong with electrics and things like that. Thanks so much. And we've actually, there's a, there's a chap, Andrew, in the town. Uh, we've been really lucky to get in touch with him and, and he's kind of um, sort of let us know that he can look after, he's like a service, um, an accredited Bosch um, service person. So okay. I think that he can actually, um, hopefully he'll be able to um, sort of help us service our bike. And we're actually working with um, the various different cycle groups, or we, we've started talking to the various different cycle groups within NERN um, to see, you know, what can, what can we maybe do to link everybody together to, because I, I, I absolutely love the idea of the green travel map and I'm so excited for, for Aaron Eco Savvy and I can't wait to see what it looks like when it's finished. And just the principle of it is just so lovely and, um, just opens up the local area to people in such a great way. I would love to see something like that, you know, replicated here in Nern and right across, right across the Highlands, you know, um, and to remove those barriers. And that's um, one thing that I think the e-bike for us here is going to help do. It's going to help remove barriers to cycling. Um, and hopefully, you know, we, I would love to see it where businesses get involved too and have a shot at um, delivering their stuff via bike instead of car and I think they'll actually get round quicker than, than they would normally um but yeah thanks I like the, the, your cargo bike looks um some of the ones I've seen before have been much bigger than that you know and yours looks uh more versatile in that you could just have a use it as a normal bike yeah or you can attach the trailer you know that's that's uh, that looks like because I'd be very really interested to see how you go with that 
we're actually storing it on top of the trailer, which is fantastic, and it can fold right down as well. So it's it's just a nifty um, little thing. And if you um, have a little watch on that that YouTube video there, you'll get to see Neil cycling around the entire town with the trailer on the back, you know, going down the main road and then coming up the small streets and then coming down and going along footpaths and stuff. So you'll see the versatility and, it, you know, mm -hmm. it is, it's a really nifty little thing um, that we've got there. Um, I've actually got one more poll to do. Yay, polls! So if there are, if there are any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat um, or please feel free, I don't know, Val, Andrew, if you want to maybe drop your emails into the chat there, just in case yep. people have specific questions that they might want to ping over to you in the future. Um, right. And uh, I'm just going to pop the final poll up on the screen. Um, please do, you know, take a couple of minutes to, to fill it out if you can. Um, I've also got a, a, a poll going more specifically for NERN to see what you feel the barriers are in NERN to, um, to cycling as a main mode of transport and what we could, what organizations like Green Hive and sort of NERN in general could do to support the switch over to e-bikes. So that is currently up on the website. Um, if you've got time, it'd be amazing to get that filled out too. And this poll that I put up on your screen just now is more just sort of feedback about the talk today and how you feel it went um, and uh, any sort of any sort of thoughts that you might have as well. Uh, that would be super. And I'm just grabbing the link for the more NERN centered survey. Yeah, I'd, I'd also actually meant to say as well that, that before Andrew lends the bikes out, he obviously does an induction with people to, to go through. Um, sorry to take the spotlight away from the poll. I didn't mean that. It was just while I remembered. It's okay. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, any advice, any sort of pro tips that you can give to us as an organisation or people who are thinking about getting involved? Um, it's gold dust, you know, because you're you're right there on the forefront. Um, so yeah, I, I love keep the tips coming, Val. <laughs> Whilst we're polling, yeah, I'm sure Andrew's got much more than me because he's the expert. Well, we 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 get people to fill in a form before they they, they take the bikes, so they get they get an induction, and um, you know, which shows them around the bike and uh, you know explains the kind of very basic kind of maintenance. And things like you know how to charge the bikes, and um, uh, you know the you know the combination lock numbers and things like that. It typically takes about half an hour per person because we're doing them individually at the moment because of COVID. Um, but um, the the form is a is a little bit of a disclaimer. You know, it just kind of assures you as an organisation that the person taking the bike has is used to riding a bike, um, so they're not you know it's not like they have they're, they're coming from not riding a bike to riding any bike <laughs> and uh, you know they feel confident and um, you know we also explain to them that um, you know they should like wash all the kind of contact surfaces and things like that because of COVID mm -hmm. so I can send you a copy of that form and you're very welcome to use that that would be amazing yeah. so long as you're okay with sharing it that would be super yeah no it's fine yeah Oh, thank you so much. Oh. oh, I'm so hyped now. I mean, like part of me just wants to go and pick the e-bike up just now and just like go for a cycle. Um, can I, I just feel like so inspired after sort of seeing how yeah. you've, you've managed with it. Um, it is that wonderful time of day where it's the beginning of the weekend. Well, not the beginning of the weekend yet, but it's the end of the webinar. I'm just going to wrap it up just now. Um, Val, Andrew, is there anything else that you'd like to sort of um, mention or, or add in? Uh, what, yeah, one thing worth mentioning is we've just got a hold of two Grease Monkey tool stations. So they're kind of standalone. Um, uh, it, it's, it looks a bit like a kind of parking meter kind of sized thing, but it, but it has um, tools hanging off it that you can use to fix pretty much any bike and it has a bicycle pump built into it. Um, they probably work best in kind of semi-covered areas um, where they're not getting a lot of wind and rain. Um, but it means that it's just kind of a public um, facility that encourages people to maintain their bikes and, and you know, quite often people using them, other people will give them a hand, for instance, if it looks like they're struggling. Okay. So we're just, we're just installing two of those. We don't, we're not quite sure how they're going to go yet, but 
we've got one in the north end of the island and one in the south end of the island. I think that's something that we could maybe. I'm I'm hoping that this one e-bike that we've got will grow into a fleet of e-bikes eventually, and mm -hmm. I'd like to see cycling infrastructure pop up around the town. So that's something that I think, mm -hmm. you know, seeing people out and about on the e-bikes, using the e-bikes. Um, more and more people will actually start to want to put in this cycling infrastructure that isn't really here in the town at the moment. So mm -hmm. Fingers yeah. crossed we're actually going to start a wee revolution which would be awesome. Yeah. I think so and the thing is you've got all the enthusiasm and, and just the drive to do it and, and that's the thing I mean Eco Savvy we, we started out just as a little shop selling some upcycled goods and, and, and we've grown so much and I know a lot of it does come down to what funding you manage to get in um, and I was going to say also to keep an eye on the impact funding partners um, emails and things, because there's been a few different possible funding options that, you know, that are specific to e-bikes, which, again, we're, we're hoping to be successful with things to kind of continue and, and yeah, build, build the fleet and, and do even more. Um, but I would definitely say e-bikes are more a kind of talk of the town these days, you know, I mean, nobody really talked about them a couple of years ago um, apart from hard, more maybe more hardcore cyclists so I think there's so much that is possible and I have every faith that you, you guys will, will absolutely soar with it so if there's anything else we can help you with as well with it just let us know oh, um, I just wanted to say thank you for having us along today oh, thank you us. no no thank you massively to to both of you for coming on and for sharing your insights and for sharing your knowledge with us as well and I think it's through groups like like ours coming together and working um, that's where the change really seems to start from so yeah so thank you to everybody that came on and tuned in today uh, for completing the poll thank you so much to Val and to Andrew from Iron Eco Savvy um, for coming along and sharing their knowledge with us today and to everybody that has helped us so far with getting our e-bike set up um, if you would like to hear more, then uh, jump onto the Green Hive website, read our travel blog, drop us an email, um, just get in touch because we would love to see you guys enjoying um, cycling as much as we do. And uh, I think I think at that, I think I think I'm gonna um, end the webinar if everybody's okay with that. Yep. Yeah, all right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy your Thursday night. And um, yep, yeah, feel free to share this video. It's gonna be up on our website and uh, get in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you, everybody.